do you get the sense that um, the technology that's in the hands of, of, um, of patients, and I guess we're pretty much talking about iPhones and, um, and, 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 and other smartphones, are they gonna, are, do you sense that we are anywhere near the point through better app, through new and better apps and in sensing devices that they could replace, that, re, that they could allow a remote visit to completely replace uh, physical visits anytime soon? Who do you want to go first? No, if you want to go first, you're, like you're about to speak. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead. Um, so I would say, I don't know about completely, but yes, um, the opportunity is there. And I think what you know, physicians certainly, I don't know about patients, are waiting for is how that integration happens seamlessly in terms of the capture of personal information. I can give you a related example. We actually worked on development of a prescription app approved by the FDA for Otsuka. So it is for depression and it has no pill associated with it, just app related. It's on their website. It's not confidential information. Um, but the whole idea of the technology intersecting is going to drastically change. And yes, the devices that we have today will have or soon will have um, the capability to integrate the monitoring aspects of big health. <laughs> I don't think it's a binary whether or not it's going to take over. I think it's going to be another tool in the arsenal. I think it's analogous to autonomous driving. Um, while there's been much money and um, effort devoted towards that, we don't have cars that are just driving on their own quite yet, but the technology is helping people and almost all the different cars that are being made now that are better able to avoid accidents. And I think it'll be something like that. I mean, it's a reality as by 2030, there's going to be a shortage of 130,000 primary care physicians in the United States alone. Um, so people are gonna have to pick up the slack and take more ownership and, and come up with uh, technology is gonna help fill that gap. So we're, this is one of the big steps we're seeing. The, the only thing I'd add to that, Ken, is uh, um, you know, I think that there is an opportunity for technology, to, you know, virtual visits to take a more and more share, but it has to be coupled by a, a better digitalization and tools around the clinical pathways. And, and, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, if you are engaging with a provider virtually, um, what is it exactly that you're looking for? And in what cases do you need to uh, migrate from that virtual environment into, uh, you know, a physical environment? Because this is healthcare at the end of the day. And everything won't be virtual. So, um, you know, having that information available to, to the virtual provider, you know, the, the physical provider who's operating virtually is just ends up being very critical. The, the more robustness that goes around that process, the more comfort, I think, when coupled with some of those monitoring tools um, uh, to, to, to migrate more and more share, but always having that stopgap of knowing exactly when the physical needs to be part of this again. Yeah, and just to chime in, I think it's going to depend upon the, the therapeutic area. You know, if we're talking like rheumatology or dermatology, could we do it virtually? Yeah, absolutely. But I think, you know, having a focus a little bit today more on the oncology side, a lot of patients aren't getting checkups. So one of the articles that came out from Time was something along the lines of like close to 100,000 additional patient deaths per year because of the fact that patients aren't getting checkups. And they're going to be diagnosed as a, maybe a later line versus you know earlier stage. So I think you can never replace maybe the, the live aspect of it, but I think it will offset. So some type of hybrid model we'll see as we go forth. We're running a little late, or on or we got started on a Q and A a little late. So unfortunately, I only have time for one more question. Um, uh, I'd like to put to all of you, and this is really a crystal ball type of question. I mean, I. Have, did you get the sense from anything we've um, learned to this point, um, um, either through watching behaviors or studying technology, that is going to prepare us for the next pandemic, um, for COVID-20, or whatever it, uh, it will be? I know we've all heard, you know, Bill Gates uh, was talking three years ago, what we needed to do to get ready for this pandemic, nobody listened. 
Um, so is there, is there any insights we're gleaning now that uh, uh, once we get beyond this, and hopefully we will sometime next year, um, that are going to prepare us for next time, and it, which will likely be less than 100 years from now? Anybody can jump in. I don't think any of us have a crystal ball, Ken. I think uh, at the end of the day, you know, you got to be ready for a curveball um, and be willing to adapt. And I think all of us have done that in some way, shape, or form. You know, like you said, it probably won't come across again in our lifetime, but next lifetime for for those after us. But at the end of the day, it's we don't know what technology is going to look like, but tech has played a, a huge role in how we've all been able to to overcome such uncertain times. I mean, I would echo what Mike is saying, um, but maybe add that some of the predictors are and are getting better. So, you know, by having um, more technology and access to technology and what's happening from a health standpoint, uh, that maybe we'll get better at predicting and it won't be so hard so fast, but it's really tough to tell. All right, I, no, okay, please, Eric. I, well, without getting political, I think that the technology is there if you look at a lot of the other countries that have handled it differently, and we could have too. I think that uh, it's it's an issue around leadership and hopefully future um, in the future we'll have a better idea on how to best handle this. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, an important point uh, to end on. Um, I want to thank everybody. Uh, thank you all really uh, very much for, uh, for a great hour, uh, enlightening hour. Um, uh, for, uh, and we have, uh, we have an election in less than two months and um, uh, that question uh, of how the pandemic has, handled, has been handled certainly in a sense be, be on the ballot and how we want to prepare for, for the next one. I can tell you that for ODP, we're actually going to have another a webinar a couple of weeks before the election, and the topic is going to be insights gained uh, um, into uh, into that election, into politics in general. So, uh, we'll uh, for all our attendees, thank you for uh, for listening and watching today. Uh, we will um, we'll be getting some information in your mailbox about that upcoming webinar. But for um, uh, but for today's group, once again, thank you very much and. Um, uh, uh, to the panelists and to the audience and I uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks all.